We want to welcome everyone. It's good to see you. I'll give everybody just, woo, just another second. That got their attention, Rusty. But it is good to see everyone this morning. We're glad that you're here. Whether you've joined us here in the auditorium or you're watching by live stream, we want to welcome each of you. We're especially glad to have guests worshiping with us today. We have some from pretty far away with us for our service, and you'll find out about that a little bit later. But if you are a guest, we're glad that you're here. Hope you can come back anytime you have the opportunity. Also, if you're a guest, we hope you'll tear, take the little tear off that's on your bulletin and complete that and place it in the offering plate later on in the service. And that way we'll have a record of your attendance. But it is good to see each of you here. By way of announcements, of course, we do hope you'll join us this evening for our service. Brother Smith will be continuing his series on angels. And if you've missed that, it's, it is very interesting, very informative. It, it explains a lot about things that happen in the Bibles when you realize the nature of angels and how God created them. But I would encourage you to come back for that tonight at 6. Then on Tuesday, we have a... It's almost an all-church luncheon. We're just knocking out you middle age group of adults <laughs> from college to senior adult. But on Tuesday, our beacons will be meeting for a pizza luncheon, but we're inviting all those kindergarten through college to come and join. We got some special things planned uh, as those age groups get together. It's a pizza luncheon. There's no charge for it, but you need to sign up today. We need to know how much pizza to, to purchase. Also, you need to sign up today you can show up without signing up, which we, even if you forget to sign up, we hope you'll come on. But if you do that, you may be involved in something special that day. Okay, but if you can, let us know today uh, if you will be able to be there. But it'll be a, a lot of fun uh, for those age groups, those going into kindergarten this fall through, or just actually next week, through uh, our senior adults, basically. But also, on Third, no, Friday is our kayaking trip to the Okotoma River down near Seminary, Mississippi. That's for those who have completed grades two on up. Also, if someone under the second grade wants to go, they need to have a parent with them. But we need that sign up today as well so we can make our reservations at the Okotoma. This is where we went kayaking last year and everybody had a wonderful time. And, uh, but that will be this Friday. So we hope you'll get signed up for that. Then uh, next Sunday, a lot of things taking place here. School's getting ready to kick off. Next Sunday, we will have our backpack blessing. So if you're involved in education system in any way as a student, as a teacher, as an administrator, if you'll maybe just have some item here next Sunday that represents what you do. If you were my teacher, it would have been a red pencil because you would have used it a lot. So you could have brought your red pencil and had that blessed. But no, but to have that here next Sunday, and that will be a time during our service as well. Uh, we will be feeding the teachers from Lake Shore Elementary this week. I still haven't been able to, to get them to lock in a day for us. Hopefully it will be Thursday, but we will be letting you know that, those who help us with that as well. Then we want to call your attention to our prayer request. Those who are sick at home or in the hospital and need a prayer, and those we have in the nursing home and others that we have on our hearts today, there's just so much going on, and, and those that we are praying for. We also want to remember our missionaries who are celebrating birthdays today. They're listed in our bulletin as well. But as we go to the Lord now, as we prepare for worship, let's just go to God in a time of intercessory prayer and of course, when we intercede, it's when we lift up the needs of someone else to God.
Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Let's stand and worship Jesus this morning and sing about his majesty. Let's lift our voices to the majesty. Majesty. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together to worship you. The privilege of being able to sing the songs of praise and be reminded even through that of the opportunity to thank you for all that you're doing and to praise your name because you are a great and loving God. You, you truly deserve all of the praise that we can express to you. Thank you for guiding us through this past week, giving us of your presence day by day to encourage and to help us along life's way. You know the concerns that we have on our hearts for others today, and we're asking that you truly be near to them with whatever the situation is. As you hear and answer that prayer, I pray that you do it in a way that will bring the greatest glory to yourself. Because, Lord, we know that you said everything that we do or say, even whatever we eat or drink, it should all be done to the glory of God. And I pray that we will be conscious of every experience of our life, everything that we do in our life needs to be that which will lift high your holy name. Thank you again for these who are here today and those who are watching by means of live stream. And I trust that you will truly encourage and bless and guide. Just show us your way, Lord, and help us to be committed to accomplishing that. And again, we can't do it in our own strength. The only way we can do what you want us to do is with your help. So help us to depend on you and lean strong on you daily is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to sing. It keeps me singing. There's within my heart. I'm 
And it is good to see each of you here this morning as we've gathered to worship the Lord. If you're a guest of ours, we do hope you'll fill out the little flap that's on your bulletin. It's perforated to tear off easily. Drop that in the offering plate when it comes by, and it'll be our way of having a record of your attendance with us. But we want to greet each other in the Lord and get to know somebody new, or maybe you haven't had a chance to say good morning to someone. Do that during our time of welcome as we... Uh, Look forward to a special treat during the time, children's time. And you who are sixth graders and under, come join us down here at the front. We have a special guest, Rick Love. and You'll hear more about him in just a moment as uh, we uh, have that children's time. Let's stand and greet each other during this time. this morning. We're glad that you are here. Word of explanation about the hats. Some of the people in our church in the past have had interesting hats that they brought to the rummage sale and these were purchased and being worn today. So that's where the hats came from. 
Back in the dark ages, when I was a little girl, I went to GAs. Y'all don't know about GAs. It's kind of like when we had CIA, the missions group, talking about that or what you learn in Team Kid. But in GAs, we would learn about missionaries. Didn't have video, didn't have recordings, very few pictures, they were in black and white. They had not invented color yet. The whole world was still black and white. And we would talk about missionaries. And when we would have a missionary come or go to another church that had a missionary there, it was so exciting because we saw a real live missionary. It was kind of like going to the zoo and seeing that elephant that you'd already, always just heard about. And then when you saw a real live elephant, see, y'all have all kind of stuff nowadays, but we didn't then. But today, we have a real live missionary with us. Rick Love is here today. Is Love Road named after your family? Okay. He said his family had that store that was on the corner there where the Exxon station is now. And that, that just hit me a while ago. And we call that Love Road. So he does have ties to our community, but he's going to share with you this morning about where he is and some of the things that he's doing as a missionary with the International Mission Board. And you have to use the mic. Yeah. I'm going to start with showing you a picture. We have a missionary family that has four children, and the youngest one is a little fella named Elijah. And one day... This missionary family was walking in their neighborhood over where I live in Dakar, Senegal. Can you say Dakar? Dakar. That's where I live, in the capital city of the country of Senegal. It's called Dakar. And Elijah was walking with his mom and dad and, and others, and his, his brothers and sisters, has one brother and two sisters. And all of a sudden, he saw his African friend. And this is what he did. Can you see that? What's he doing there? Hugging him. And I don't know whether this camera up here, if that'll pick it yeah, up Yeah, if y'all want to switch now. Can you see that at all? Maybe not. Well, let, the, give the, let them <laughs> zoom. No, you turn and they'll move the camera. Oh, they'll move the and camera. And it's a different okay. picture now. Like right here? You've got a different picture up there now, oh, I, I think. Do. Let me go back. Yeah. There you okay, you got it. Okay, that's Elijah giving a big hug. You know, we have 18 of us in Dakar that are missionaries with International Mission Board. And half of those, nine of them, are children, just like you. And everybody has a part because we're trying to share about Jesus and the love of Jesus with people. Where I'm at in Dakar, Senegal, by the way, there's a map up there I think you can see. But um, at the top of Africa, it's wide. At the bottom, it's kind of narrow. I'm at the top and as far west as you can go. You, you can't go any further west than the capital city of Dakar, Senegal, on mainland Africa. So it's only like a seven or eight hour flight from Washington, D.C., which is where I fly out of. And I've been there since January of 2010, and all of us do different things as missionaries, but we'd like to talk to people and we want to tell them about Jesus. And most of them don't know a lot of Bible stories, so we tell a lot of Bible stories. We share Bible verses. Uh, some of our missionaries work in our Baptist Center. They teach English, and in every English class, there is a Bible story that they tell. And some of us work at the university. Some go and try to talk to students about Jesus. And what I do is I just walk the streets of the different parts of, of, of Dakar, which most of the streets in the neighborhoods are all sand. So I usually wear sandals, and I get sand all over my feet. And sometimes the sand is really deep. And uh, so I sing a song like, like, sand, 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 walking in the sand. You know, there's lots of it. And, uh, but the people are very friendly. There's about 92 to 93% of them are Muslim. 5 to 6% of them are Catholic. And less than 1% are evangelical Christians, which would include Baptist, Methodist, Church of God, Pentecostal, all of those, less than 1%. So most of the people I see when I walk, and the city has a lot of people, about a million and a half, most of the people I see don't know about Jesus. And so a lot of times, you know, they'll see me, especially since I've had a beard, they want to know am I Muslim. And I say, well, no, I'm, I follow Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? Oh, so, yeah, we know who Jesus is. Well, who is Jesus to you? Well, he's a prophet. I said, yeah, he is a prophet. What else do you know? Uh, nothing. <laughs> so 
that's how I start to talk about Jesus. And I'll tell them, you know, who Jesus is, where he came from. Where did Jesus come from, by the way? Anybody know? Where did he start out at? Okay, but before that, where was he? Before that, he was in heaven. And I tell people, because there's Muslims believe in a lot of prophets, but I say there's only been one that came to earth from heaven, and that was Jesus. And there's only one that never, never sinned. Who was that? Jesus. Jesus never sinned. And I explain to them. I tell them a lot of stories. You know the story of Jonah? Jonah? You remember that it had a big fish? Remember God told Jonah to go out and, and to tell these people over here to, to repent of their sins, and he didn't want to go. What what Jonah do? He got on a boat. He was running away from God. And what happened when he was on the boat? There was a big storm. And what happened after that? You remember Jonah said, I'm the problem. I'm running from God. He said, throw me into the ocean. So did they throw him in the ocean? Well, can you swim? Can you swim? What, can you swim in the middle of the ocean? For how long? Well, Jonah got thrown in the middle of the ocean. I asked one Senegalese man, now, if you get thrown in the middle of the ocean, what are you going to do? And you know what he told, told me? He said, I'm going to die because there's a lot of water in the ocean. And I said, but Jonah didn't die. Why? You know why? Okay, a lot of people say it was a whale. I just used big fish. But Jonah spent three days and three nights in the middle of the, of the, of the belly of that big fish. And he got to thinking, I think, he probably thought the only reason I'm living is because God made a way for me to escape. You know, when you read the Bible carefully, there's a lot of stories where God makes a way to escape. There's no way. Like Moses in the Red Sea. You remember when God led Moses and the people of Israel, to, and they were out at the Red Sea, and all Pharaoh and all the soldiers were coming after them to capture them and take them back to Egypt. And everybody got afraid because what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And God opened up the Red Sea, and what happened? They walked across, and they escaped. And we usually tell stories like that, all these escape stories. I tell a lot of them, and I'll say this when I get finished. I say that's, all those stories are teaching us something very important, and that is we all are, have a big problem. We're all sinners, and we're all going to hell, and we cannot save ourselves, and that's why Jesus came, because he is our way to escape. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody goes to the Father, which is in heaven, but through me. And so we share that a lot, and we share it in a simple way. In fact, we tell stories that you probably hear in Sunday school all the time. Those are the stories we tell because they don't know those stories. In fact, you could even be a missionary. Did you know that? All you got to do is tell a Bible story to somebody. You know any Bible stories? You know a lot of Bible stories, don't you? You know the story of Adam and Eve and... Noah, you know those stories. You can tell other people. And that's all a missionary does is tell other people. Okay? Thank you very much. Yes. Today, if you look on the front of your bulletin, and I'm not going to say coincidence because I know God planned this out, it shows a picture of a lady and a little boy, and it has the verse Matthew 28, 19, that says, Go and make disciples of all nations. And that's what Mr. Rick does. He goes and shares Jesus with others, just like he's saying we can do. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for this day, Lord, and the blessings that you've given us. And God, the blessing we have of having Rick in the service with us this morning and sharing with us and our children. And God, I pray that if there is anyone here today who feels called to be a missionary or, or Lord, to go to a certain place to tell others about you, whether it's at their work, at their school, at home, or neighborhood. Get the, God, they'll do, or we will do what you ask us to do. And God, I do pray for these children and pray that you continue to be with them as they grow in knowledge of you. And God, even through the service today and the things that are shared through word and through song and prayer, God, that they will be, as well as us, drawn closer to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus.
Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him, his name is wonderful Jesus my Lord As our deacons come forward for the morning offering we're certainly thankful for what God's blessed us with and the privilege of giving back a portion to him and of course part of that goes to help missionaries all over the world like Rick Love and and uh, we just pray that you will Understand that you're a part of what God's doing, even through your tithes and offerings. Would you lead us in prayer, James? Father God, we come to you this morning. We just want to tell you, Lord, that Jesus, we love you. We love you because you first loved us. Amen. We just want to thank you for all the many blessings that you have bestowed on us, Lord. And uh, the thank you for our pastor, our Sunday school teachers. Lord, we just thank you for all these good people. Lord, we pray that you would take this offering that we're about to receive. Use it for your good and to build your kingdom for all you do. Forgive us for our sins, and we'll be glad to give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of sin and shame, through grace he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me. And he lifted me from shades of night to plains of light. Oh, praise his name, he lifted me. He called long before I heard, before my sinful heart was stirred. But when I took him at his word, forgiven he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, Oh, praise his name, he lifted me. Now on a higher plane I dwell, and with my soul I note as well. Yet how or why 
I cannot tell. He should have lifted me from sinking sand. He lifted me with tender hand. He lifted me from shades of night to plains of light. Oh, praise his name. He lifted me. Oh, praise his name. He lifted me. Thank you, Robbie. Open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 1. While you're opening that, Rick, I'm going to ask you a question. What day is your birthday? December 30th. September. September 30th. Now, all of you know that our missionary prayer list, of course, if it falls on Sunday, it appears in our bulletin. When you see his name come September 30th on your uh, prayer guide, some of you get the open windows. It's in that and other guides, too, that uh, have our missionaries' birthdays on it. You'll know when you see that name who it is, all right? You can pray for him. Pray for him every day, but especially it's a reminder to us when it comes to their birthdays to pray for them. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 is our passage for today as we continue through our study of the book of Romans. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. In that particular day, Rome was the greatest city of the world. You can't say that today because there are a lot of other uh, cities of the world that are great cities. But in that particular day and time, Rome was the city. It was the great city of Rome is the way it was referred to by many people. And some people felt that Paul would be embarrassed to go to Rome to preach the gospel because of the greatness and uh, the, the kind of city that it was. But Paul is writing this letter to the people, the Christians of Rome, saying, as we've already seen, I've longed to come, I've made plans to come, I'm coming soon. As we said last week, he didn't realize it would be a while later because of being arrested, put in prison in Caesarea two years, finally getting to Rome later as a prisoner, but he was grateful when he made it. And uh, under house arrest, people were able to come to him, and he was able to share the gospel. But Paul is saying here, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm ready to go to Rome and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ even there. You see, in Rome, they were putting people to death for being Christians. It's interesting, they even called them cannibals. (laughs) They were putting these cannibals to death. Now, why would you call a Christian a cannibal? Well, they were those people who were eating the body and blood of their leader. Boy, how badly they misunderstood the Lord's Supper. See, we, we have the Lord's Supper, and it's a reminder to us of what Jesus did that we could be saved. But the people of Rome felt that, boy, those folks are cannibals in the way that they, uh, way they're talking and everything. And they actually put people to death, calling them cannibals, even though we know quite different from that. But today we're going to talk about the gospel. You've heard about the gospel. People say all the time, well, I like gospel music or gospel preaching or the gospel press. Well, what is the gospel? What are we talking about? Well, in these, this passage, we have three things that are shared with us of what the gospel is in just these two verses. If you'd like to follow along, again, using the outline on the back of your bulletin, these three things I want us to see out of these two verses of what is the gospel. Notice the excitement about the gospel. Paul was so excited about it, he said, I'm not ashamed of it. Let me just tell you what the word gospel means. It literally means good news. Good news. The gospel is good news 
that liberates you. And once you understand that uh, and what the good news really is, you'll, you'll understand the joy that was in the life of Paul and, and made him excited about wanting to go and share that good news with others. In fact, when we understand it, it keeps us from being bent all out of shape too. It helps us to understand a joy about life and living when we realize what that good news is all about. Now, I've been told, because I wasn't living during that time, that when Germany surrendered during World War II, that people literally went out into the streets of their neighborhoods and, and were, were shouting about the fact that Germany had surrendered. And then a short time later, when Japan surrendered, I'm told that people did the same thing. Not only in our country, but also in England and other places, they were going out into the streets and, and truly shouting out, Japan has surrendered. It was good news that they were wanting to share, that the war was over. Well, the gospel is the same way. It's good news. It's liberating, life-giving news that needs to be shared. Well, that's the second point. Not only is it good news, but the gospel is worth sharing as well. And that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed to go to Rome or anywhere else because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's good news. And he was wanting to go share it there in Rome. It's a shame that we're so prone to share bad news today, isn't it? They say bad news travels faster than good news. Now, I know you've heard about people who gossip. My Aunt Louise, one of those, loves to gather. You know Uncle Snuffy and Aunt Louise? Okay. She loves to gather at the gossip fence and get the latest news. She doesn't have Internet where she is. She just has to gather at that fence and got, get the news. But today, through Internet and uh, texting and all uh, Facebooking and all this stuff, people find out more stuff, and the bad news travels fast. I wish the good news about Jesus would travel just as fast. It needs to because it is liberating news. It's not that which will tear down and, and, and tear up people's lives. The question I have for you this morning, are you excited about the gospel? Are you excited about the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you in your life personally? Are you sharing that good news with everybody around you? Because when you know good news, you want to share it. All of you have had some kind of good news happen to you in your life other than those of you who are saved, and you wanted to share it. It could have been the, the, the birth of a baby or the birth of a grandchild, you carry pictures around with you, and now you can carry all kinds of them on those phones, and you're glad to share them with people. Or maybe it was that 10-pound bass you caught that you wanted everybody to know about, or that 8-point buck, or whatever. There was something that you were excited about that you wanted others to know, and you gladly shared with them. The good news of Jesus is better than any other good news you've ever had shared with you that which changed your life you should be excited about it and wanting to tell others about it because it is liberating news I read something this week and honestly I don't know if it's true or not so I'm just wanting you to know that right off the bat I read it though that it that it happens it, and some of you may want to check it out and see I'm told that if you take a goose and you oh, this is what I read if you take a goose and you draw a white line around that, a circle around that goose, that that goose will not go outside that circle. It'll stay inside that white circle. Now, I don't know. Again, I read that. But I can tell you something I do know. There are a lot of God's people who won't go outside the circle of the church and share the good news. They'll gladly talk about it in church and in their Sunday school class. They'll talk about all that Jesus has done for them, and they'll talk about the Bible and all of this kind of thing in church. But when they go outside the church building, into the community, into the workplace, into the schools this next week or the next week after that, according to when your particular school starts, we have some starting even this coming week. But that, when you go into those places, suddenly they don't want to share that good news. We're kind of like that goose that won't get outside the white circle. We, won't want, we don't want to share the good news of Jesus, it seems, outside the circle of those that we know know about Jesus already. So I'm wanting to tell you that we need to be sharing that good news everywhere. 
be at the workplace, at, at school, on college campuses. It needs to be shared in the business places, in the hospitals where people need to hear about Jesus and what he's done for us. Preachers love to talk about the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody. He was never an ordained minister. He was a shoe salesman in Chicago who found Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he got so excited about it that he quit selling shoes and started going everywhere telling people about Jesus. He was a big man, we're told, and had that full beard that you see there on that picture. And he went everywhere telling people about Jesus. But he murdered the Queen's English, we're told. That was what they said about him. In fact, one time he was over in London speaking to a group of educated, sophisticated English people, and he started his message this way. He said, don't never think that God don't love you, for he do. And he went on telling about Jesus and all that Jesus had done for him. And on one such occasion when he finished speaking, one of those dignified English women came up to Dwight and she said, Mr. Moody, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And they said that he hung his head down and he said, I am ashamed of myself, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. You see, he shook two continents for Jesus because he wasn't ashamed and though he was not ordained, he began to, in fact, they called him a preacher, though he was never ordained as a preacher, but he went everywhere. And huge gatherings of people would come and hear and lives were changed. He literally shook two continents because he was not ashamed of the gospel and was willing to tell people wherever he went about Jesus Christ and his great love for us. So, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not either. I hope you're not. I hope you're willing and wanting to tell others what Jesus means to you. Secondly, what about the effect of the gospel? The effect of the gospel. Look at verse 16. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. What Paul is saying here is that the gospel has power from God. Has power from God. It's not man's power. Man did not originate this power. Rome knew all about power. They were the military power of the world of that day. They had governmental power. They had the, the Roman Senate and, and all of the, the power of that body. And if you've read and remember your history about that, they were the pinnacle of human power. They were the pinnacle also of cultural power of that day. You talk about power, Rome knew what power was in every area of life. But Paul was saying, I want to tell you about a power that is from God, a power that can change lives. And he, he shared it. Now, I love that word uh, power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. That's the Greek word dunamis, that we get our word dynamite or dynamo from. Now, if you saw a person walking around with a stick of dynamite and it was lit, what would you say? Get out of here. Something's about to happen. <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? You'd probably start running. Because you'd know something's fixing to happen. Well, I want you to know that's what the gospel is. When the gospel is shared, something always happens. Everywhere Paul went sharing the gospel, there were those who rejected it. There were those who rejected him because he brought the message about it. But there were always those who accepted as well. I want you to know something always happens when the gospel is shared. Jesus is able to take that which we share about what Jesus means to us and use it because it's the power of God. It's not your power. It's not your eloquence. It's what God has done and what God will do through that which you share that will make the difference in other people's lives. Anywhere the gospel is shared, something is going to happen because it's power from God. But then also it says it has the power to save everyone has the power to save everyone because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Let's talk about that word saved for a moment. Just kind of throw it around in Christianity. If I were to sit down and, with you and ask you, are you saved? You would either say, yes, I am, or 
you know, absolutely I have been, or no, uh, I, I'm not, or you may say, I don't know. Uh, others may say, well, I don't know what you mean by being saved. Some people say, well, I don't like to use the word saved because it's old-fashioned. That's what some people say. Well, I want you to know, if you were in a house that was burning, and a fireman came into that house and got you out of it, you would say that fireman saved you, wouldn't you? Or if you were in the water, if you had a boat accident and you were floating in the water and someone came along with a, a, a life raft or a boat and, and got you out of that water, you would say they saved you from the water. Or if you were in a swimming pool and, and you were drowning and the life... Uh, guard jumped in and pulled you out to safety you would say the lifeguard saved you that's not a bad word to use is it when you understand that you were on the brink of death and someone saved you someone delivered you got you out of that situation and that's why I don't think being saved is is a bad word to use concerning what Jesus does for us in our life the salvation that he brings is a saving experience it saves us from death and the penalty of our sin. Jesus literally rescues us. He saves us. He delivers us from our sin when we ask him to. You see, it was the uh, Philippian jailer who was about to commit suicide. He was the end, at the end of the rope of his life, and he said to, to the apostle Paul, Tell me, sir, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What does it mean to be saved? The Bible actually has, and every time you see the word saved, it has all three tenses with it in the original language. I have been saved. That means when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were saved at that moment from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The moment you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were saved from the penalty of sin. You are being saved every day as a child of God from the power of sin. You see, Satan continues to tempt. Jesus said, I'll give you the strength to overcome that temptation. All you've got to do is ask me. I'm right here with you. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted more than you can stand, and will, with that temptation, provide a way of escape. That's God's promise, to give us the strength, the power, to overcome the temptation. So I'm being saved from the power of sin. And one day I will be saved, future tense, when this life is over here and I get to heaven, I'm going to be saved from the presence of sin. Because in heaven, sin can't get there. There won't even be any temptation there. So we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. So all three tenses are being used when you see that word saved in the Bible. Past tense, the moment you accepted Christ as your Savior. Present tense, what's happening in your life daily. And future tense, when you get to heaven and you're saved from the very presence of sin. Now, the Bible uses big words to describe some of that, like the past tense of it, say, salvation, how I have been saved. That's justification. He makes us just as if we had never sinned. In the present tense of what's going on now, it is sanctification, meaning we're being sanctified, made more like Jesus every day as we're strengthened by the power of God to overcome the temptation of Satan. And one day, future tense, when I am saved, when I get to heaven and I'm saved from the very presence of sin, the big word there used in the Bible is glorification. We will be glorified at that point. But all of it's talking about the same word, saved. I am saved. I'm being saved. I will be saved. But it doesn't mean when he says, I will be saved, that you're gonna, you possibly can lose your salvation. No. When you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiving you of your sins because you ask him in faith to do that, that's done. 
and you're in the palm of his hands. No one can snatch you out, and the Holy Spirit of God seals you over. God protects you in his hand. That's the promise of God in his word. But then Paul mentions two groups of people. And look again at verse 16. He says, The gospel has power, first of all, to save the Jew. And then he says it has the power to save the Gentile. Now, why does he make that distinction? Well, it's because some people thought the gospel was for the Jewish people. Jesus came as uh, born into the family of, of, uh, a G- of Jewish family. As the Old Testament had prophesied that he would be of the tribe of David, but be greater than David. The Bible and all the prophecies. He came among the people that God had chosen to be his message bearers to the world. They failed miserably in that task that God gave them because they, be- they kept wanting to be more like others rather than stand out and be distinct from others where they could share that good news. But isn't that like us so often as God's people today? Rather than want to be distinct and stand out as people who are different because of what Jesus has done for us, we want to be like everybody else. Ask any parent who's had a teenager. Ask you when you were a teenager, didn't you say to your folks, well, everybody else is doing it, why can't I? We want to be like everybody else instead of be different. God says, I want you to be different. I want you to, to, to be such that people will see me in you and want to be like you. Not you be like them, but that's what the Jewish people did. They became like the folks of the world about them, and God kept bringing judgment on them to, to try to show them the error of their way and bring them back to where they ought to be. But it was, in fact, for a, a hundred years, Christianity was thought of as a part of the Jewish religion. And, and if you know your history, you know that, that uh, even today, uh, Christianity, uh, well, it's not a branch today. Even today, though, there's Orthodox Jew, there's Reformed Judaism, and there's a couple other branches of it as well. But it was at the Council of Jamnia when that distinction, some of them thought it was, you know, Christianity was just a branch of Judaism. But at the Council of Jamnia, the rabbi, Jewish rabbis themselves made it illegal, according to Jewish law, to be a Jew in good standing and be a Christian as well. You see, it was Judaism that rejected Christianity. Christianity didn't reject Judaism. But they rejected, said, You can't be a Jew in good standing and be a Christian too. Of course, God had already called Paul to go to the known world of that day and and preach to the Gentiles. Because Jesus had said, I came for everybody. And in the Jewish eyes, you were either a Jew or a Gentile. There were only two groups of people. And that's the reason (coughs) Paul is saying here that Jesus came to save both the Jew as well as the Gentile. That includes every person. And so Paul is saying the gospel was delivered first to the Jews. Jesus Christ was a Jew. My greatest friend was a Jewish carpenter. Did you know that? Hope he was, he's yours too. He grew up, though, and went to that cross and paid the price of my sins. That's the reason he's my greatest friend. He's also my Savior. But he was a Jewish carpenter who did that for you and for me. And... and we, we still, we love Jewish people, you know. God, God's people love all people. Though Christian, Jude, Judaism rejected Christianity, Christianity's never rejected Judaism. He came to his own, the Bible says in John 1. He came to his own, meaning the Jews, but his own received him not. They wouldn't accept him. In fact, They were the ones, the religious leaders, who actually had him put on the cross. You and I know it was our sins that held him on that cross because he could have come down. But he gave himself for you and me. People are always asking, you know, preacher, can a a Jew go to heaven? 
I said, yes, a Jew can go to heaven. If they, by faith, ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins and commit their life to Jesus, they can go to heaven. No, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean, because they're a Jew, can they go to heaven without Jesus Christ uh, in their life? Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say, because I've thought about this long and hard. You hear the discussions even on television. A Jew can go to heaven without Jesus if he will keep the law of God perfectly. If he will keep the law of God perfectly, he can go to heaven without Jesus Christ. The only problem with that, only one person's ever done that, and that was Jesus. A man who lived about 33 and a half years, he's the only one who ever kept the law perfectly. You see, that's what Paul continued to say to people. We can't keep it. He said, I tried it. I couldn't do it. Nobody else has ever been able to do it. He said, that's why we need the grace of God. He was saying to the Jewish people of that day, we can't do it. We've tried for years. That's why we've had to keep bringing our sacrifices over and over and over again. Because we can't keep the law perfectly. But if a Jew could keep the law perfectly, he could go to heaven without Jesus. They'd say, but oh, they're, but they're God's chosen people, and, and they're good folks, and they believe in God. Why can't they go to heaven? Well, if you're going to let the Jew go to heaven the same, that way, then you've got to let everybody else. If you believe in God and you're a good person, you ought to go to heaven. Except the Bible says we can't be good enough to go to heaven on our own. You see... That's why Jesus had to come and die for our sins. Even Jewish rabbis admit that people need Jesus Christ as their Savior. You see, that's why Paul prayed, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He didn't say, I thank God they're already saved. He said, My heart's desire and prayer is that they will be saved. I pray they will be. Now I want you to know, God is not through with the nation of Israel. In fact, when we get to chapters 9, 10, and 11, those three chapters are all about the Jewish people and how God is not through with them as a nation. We'll talk about that when we get there. But individual Jewish people, like the Apostle Paul himself, must, <coughs> must find Jesus Christ. The gospel is the power to save everyone. And all the rest of us are, in, are included. Not the Jew first, also the Gentile. All of us are included. The power, the dunamis, the dynamite is available. The power of God to bring salvation to all people. Third, the explanation of the gospel. Look at verse 17. This is where Paul explains what the gospel is. He says, In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Now, in the original language, that says from faith to faith. Just as it is written, and then here's the quotation that you've all probably heard, the righteous will live by faith. Now, look how he explains this. Let me tell you, first of all, what the word righteousness means. The key word to the entire book of Romans is understanding that the word righteousness means right standing before God. Right standing before God. Here is God in all of his absolute holiness and perfection, and if you want to have a relationship with him, and want to be able to stand before him. And I'm not talking about in heaven only. I'm talking about he, even here in earth. You must be righteous. For you, for you to go to heaven when you die, you have to be in right standing before God. And Jesus is the one who makes that possible. You see, Jesus was perfect. He, he was the perfect Lamb of God. God's sacrifice that came to the world. <coughs> Son who came to this world and, and, and made possible our salvation. He's the one. 
It said, I promise you can have a right standing before God when you come to a, to a saving relationship with me. Now, God's righteousness, first of all, we need to understand, is not humanly possible. It's not humanly possible. I want to show you four quick things about righteousness. It's, first of all, not humanly possible. Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now you say, well, uh, yeah, I, I can understand all those bad things I've done, all those bad thoughts I've had, all of those things are, are like filthy rags to God. But that's not what that verse says. That verse says that all of the good deeds that we've done, the best deed you've ever done, in the eyes of God is like a filthy rag. And the, and the Greek description there is a rag that's not worth keeping. And I say that because there are times when you and I have used rags to clean things up, and we'll wash that rag out and dry it and use it again. But this word for filthy rags here means that that rag has been used to the point that it is so filthy, so dirty, so rotten that you can't even save it anymore. You can't wash it and use it again. It's only to be disposed of, thrown away, destroyed. That's what the best that we can offer, the best that we can be, is like in the eyes of God. Our righteousness, that means our goodness, as good as we can be, is like a filthy rag in the eyes of God. You see, it's a matter of comparison. We compare ourselves with one another. We can look pretty good. But when you compare yourself to God, we fall far short of His glory. Notice what Jeremiah 13 said. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. You see, an Ethiopian is a black person. And, and the Bible is saying that an Ethiopian can't change his skin, a white person can't change his skin, a red person can't change his skin. He said even the leopard can't change its spots. You who are used to doing bad, he said, you can't change even though you want to, maybe. You see, there are a lot of people who get this idea, well, I know that I'm not the kind of person I need to be, and I'm going to clean up my life, and I'm going to straighten up and do right. Sounds good. In fact, you can go to the bookstores or the library and there are whole sections on self-help books. Any subject matter that you want, there's a self-help book about it. But as much as you try to clean up your act and do good, the Bible says you can't. That's what Jeremiah is saying. You can't do it. You who are accustomed to doing evil can't change on your own. That's what he's saying. We can't do it. We can't fix ourselves. You cannot save yourself. You can't be good by yourself. So the first thing you have to understand that God's righteousness is humanly impossible. Second, God's righteousness was a gift paid for by Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, God made him, talking about Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, let me explain that. God in His holiness and righteousness and purity is up here, and here we are in our sinfulness, in need of that which He has. As good as we try to be, we can't be good enough. And the good news is that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to be that mediator, to be that one who came to bring God's holiness and our sinfulness to bring us together in Christ, to make us righteous. You see, when Jesus died on that cross, all of my sins and all of your sins and all of the sins of everybody in the world were put upon Jesus. And the righteousness of Jesus, because he, had, he was perfect, was then put upon those of us who by faith would trust Him. That's the greatest swap, the best swap you will ever make in life. 
You've swapped a lot of things, I'm sure. But your sins swapped for the righteousness of God is the best it could ever be because Jesus paid the price for your sins and mine, gave of himself for you and me. That doesn't happen automatically, though. And that's my next point. The righteousness must be accepted by faith. Some people say, well, if I, if I try to be good enough, then it'll, it, it, God will just automatically do that for me? No. It doesn't happen automatically. You can't just be good and then all of a sudden God says, well, you've done enough good things. <clears throat> and there are some people that feel like, well, I've, I've fed the poor. I've given clothes to those that need clothes. I've, I've done good acts and deeds to all these people in all kinds of situations. It doesn't matter how good you try to be. Remember, your goodness is still like filthy rags to God. We have to accept it by faith. It's not automatic that it's going to happen. It is an intentional decision that you and I make when by faith I accept what Jesus said he would do if I would ask him to forgive my sins. I believe that. And because I believe that, by faith I'm trusting him to do what he said if I would do what he said I needed to do. That's what faith is. Philippians 3, 9. He's still talking about righteousness here. And he says, And to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, and is by faith. And all that means is that you've got to believe you are righteous before God. You believe that Jesus died to take away your sin, to pay the price of your sins. It's, you know, something you may not feel. Hard to comprehend sometimes how God could love you and me that much that he would die in your place and my place on that cross. But the Bible says it is faith unto faith. Let me try to explain that. Faith unto faith. When I was born in Pensacola, Florida, I'm told that the doctor whacked me on the bottom and I cried real loudly. And after I cried, I took in a deep breath. And ever since then, I've been breathing air that's around me. You probably had that same experience. But it was the first Sunday of July of 1956 in Crowe, Louisiana that I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. And from that day onward, it's been faith by faith. That's what that's meaning. You see, just as I'm breathing air every day, my walk with Jesus is faith by faith every day. If I quit breathing this physical air, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to die physically, aren't I? I'm not going to keep, I'm not going to be up here for sure. I'm going to be out on this floor or something and gone. Same way spiritually, the walk with the Lord is faith by faith. Once you trust him as Savior and Lord of life, it's a daily faith by faith. It's a breathing just like I breathe Naturally, it's just natural for me to breathe. So my walk with the Lord is faith by faith. It's an all, all, every day. It's an all the time experience of I'm living by faith. I'm trusting Him. I'm I'm asking that His will be done in my life. I'm seeking what He would desire for me to do with my life. It's just Lord, I want You, and I want my life to be what You want it to be. And it is faith by faith. That's what He's talking about in that verse. That that. <clears throat> that we read there a moment ago where he's saying in verse 17, uh, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. First to last means by faith by faith. It means from the beginning of our experience with the Lord until we're taken on to heaven. It's all, it's all the way through. It's from now till then. And, and I believe in Jesus back when I was saved. And, and I'm still believing today. I'm still trusting him every day with my life. Moment by moment. That's the way it is. And then last. God's righteousness 
results in right living. You see, it's not earned by living the right way. You don't get, you don't get saved by living right. But once you are saved by the grace of God because of your faith in Him, you will want to live right. He puts that desire in your heart. Now, does that mean you're going to live a perfect life? No. We're going to still sin. We're not perfect here. But we should sin less every day because of our growing in the Lord. It should be a growing experience. That, that And, and I, when I do sin, <clears throat> there should be a hatred for what I do that causes me to, to seek His forgiveness. Lord, forgive me of that and strengthen me that I'll not do it again. There's not the, the, the joy of sinning. There's the, the hatred of it and the desire to be more of what he wants me to be. Read 1 John chapter 3 sometime, and it's, it's all about that, that letter, 1 John chapter 3. Go and read that. And I finish by telling you that salvation is not a, something we earn from God. It's unmerited. It's a gift. The Bible says not of works lest we would boast about it. We have a problem. Your problem, my problem, is that we were all born in sin. And in sin, it's like that sinking sand of quicksand. And you're in this pit of quicksand. And there's a snake ready to bite you. There are many people who may come along and tell you how to get out of that, how to get out of the quicksand. A lot of people will give you help along life's way to tell you what you need to do. But only Jesus would climb down into that pit and lift us out of that pit and take upon himself that bite of that snake. You see, Satan thought he had Jesus when he was put on that cross and he died on that cross. But three days later, he came back to life. And he's alive today. The Bible says forevermore he is alive and will be. Yes, as Robbie sang a while ago, from sinking sand, he lifted me. With tender hand, he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise his name, he lifted me. Out of that sinking sand, to be a new person in him. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to the Jew first, also to the Gentile. And it brings about a righteousness that I can't do myself. It's a righteousness from God that's faith by faith. It's day by day. I'm walking with him and wanting to live for him and be pleasing to him. Would you bow with us in prayer? If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, I want to invite you to make such a commitment. Because nobody can do it for you. And as I said, it's not an automatic thing just by trying to be good. It's something you have to intentionally do by admitting you're a sinner, Lord, I've sinned. I know we've all sinned and come short of your glory. And I want to ask you to forgive me and to save me and to help me live my life each day the way you want me to. If you would pray such a prayer, the Lord Jesus said, if you pray it and mean it, I'll forgive you. I'll save you. And I'll walk with you daily. And I would ask you in a moment to come and join me here at the front as we'll be singing the invitation as an indication that that's the commitment you want to make. There may be others of you who have other decisions that need to be made, a rededication of life. Maybe you've gotten off track with Jesus. You're a child of his. You know you were saved. But you know that your life isn't pleasing to him, and you want to pray and ask prayer that your life will be all that he wants it to be. Maybe that you need to move your membership to go to work with God's people here. Whatever it might be, we invite you to come as God leads. And dear Lord, this is our prayer this morning, that as we understand what you would have for us to do with our lives, 
we would be willing to say, Lord, I can't do it myself. I'm trusting you for it. Here am I, Lord. Save me. Restore me. Help me to be the person you want me to be, where you want me to be. Whatever the decision is, Lord, help me to do your will is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand together, as we sing, you come as God leads. You know, our missionary was talking about how God makes a way when there seems to be no way. And he made that way for Jonah. He lifts us, up, lifts us out of that sinking sand and from shades of night. Words on on the screen, but let's sing God will make a way. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for Closely to his side with love and strength for each new day, he will make a way, he will make a way. Let's sing that again. God will. seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength continues to play. If you would bow your heads. Maybe there's someone on your mind. Maybe there's someone in your family. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to give to God this morning. God will make a way for you. seems to be in a way works in ways we cannot see he will make a way for me he will be my guide hold me closely to his side with love and strength Is there someone else? Let God have his way in your life. Just, just, just play for a second more. I tell you, God's working. He's touching lives. He's spoken to hearts this morning. And if there's a decision you need to make, we want to give you that opportunity to make it because that's the most important th part of this service today is when you have that chance to do what Jesus wants you to do, and you say, I'm ready to do it. Here am I, Lord. And I'm just here to receive you and to share with you and to pray for you because this is all that God is doing right here. Maybe if all's well in your life, you could pray for someone else who's on your heart that you know has a need in their life.
Amen. Let me share with you. I had one coming, rededicating a life, and I encourage you to pray for her as she desires that closer walk with the Lord. And then we have two coming this morning, making public a profession of faith in the Lord. Having already made it, Thomas said he made his at camp, and uh, now coming to make it public. Ms. Vanny having made it uh, a few weeks ago, but now coming to make hers public. Vanny Mouillet, Lester's wife, coming to make public her commitment to Jesus and desiring baptism to be a part of this church family, and Thomas and Nina coming to do the same thing. If you would welcome the decision on the part of these two, would you let it be known by saying amen? amen. And certainly we rejoice with you all. We're going to be praying for you, and we look forward to... to uh, walking with each other and encouraging each other every day because that's what it's all about is God's people helping one another be all that God wants us to be. Yeah, grandmother and grandson. Amen. And I'm going to ask them to stand with me at the back door to give you the opportunity to pledge your prayer support to them as we do to them that we will truly be of help to each other to walk as God wants us to walk. Aren't you thankful? Amen. Isn't God good? <laughs> Amen. Whew. Lord's just continuing on blessing. And I just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Rick, thank you for being with us today. We're going to get even advanced word. Steve called us, what, Thursday? Told us he's here. Told you about my friend. And uh, glad we could plug you in today. We're going to give you even more time and uh, look forward to it. And uh, pray for Rick uh, and his ministry there in, in uh, Senegal. That's not too far from y'all's home in Kenya, is it? Our track members. Y'all know where Senegal is, don't you? <laughs> I guarantee you. And uh, glad that y'all are back today worshiping with us. These part of the... the student body of uh, ULM with us and uh, these don't ever try to outrun them they're on the track team they'll, they'll beat you every time uh, I guarantee you <laughs> but uh, so happy that y'all are with us today again too I tell you hope to see you tonight at uh, 6 o'clock for our evening worship we're going to continue speaking about angels they're part of God's warriors and uh, or they are God used by God as warriors. And we'll be dealing with that tonight as we look at, at, at them. But let's bow together for closing prayers. We thank the Lord for what he's doing, continuing to do, and look forward to, to that which is yet ahead for each of us. And uh, I'm going to ask you all to go with me to the back door. But as we pray together, uh, Scotty Barnes, would you lead us in this prayer, please, sir?